On Read, Write, Roar, enhance your writing with figurative language as we explore Michigan's beautiful beaches and dunes. Then, learn how dune rescues happen and why some visitors get stranded. Adventure awaits on Read, Write, Roar. This program is made possible in part by the State of Michigan and by and by viewers like you. Thank you. Have you ever played on a sandy beach, a sandy dune, or a sandbox? From the beaches of Lake Huron to Houghton and Higgins Lakes, to Lake Michigan, to Lake Superior, and so many lakes in between, I have always loved digging my toes into the sand. Did you know authors like to play too? Sure, many of them like to play in the sand, but today we are going to explore how writers play with words to revise their writing. I'm Mrs. DeFall, and as a writer, I love to revise. Revision means to re-see our writing over and over again. It's the part of the writing process where we rewrite to make our words come to life for our readers. One way I absolutely love to revise is by using figurative language, which is playful language. I love to play with language even more than I love to play in the sand. Today, we will revise our writing using similes, idioms, and metaphors, which are types of figurative language. Check out this short story I wrote that I know I need to revise. Please read along with me. Before Drew raced for the water, he said, Grandma, come in with me, please. No, you go, Grandma said, shaking her head. I'll sit here with my toes in the sand. Aw, Grandma, Drew teased. Drew, Grandma pretended to be offended and then tousled his hair. Have fun, I'll keep my eye on you from here. Drew gave his grandma a hug. Grandma's hug felt good. Running so fast, Drew skidded into the water. Floating on his back, he looked up into the sky. He felt so thankful Grandma brought him to the beach. Grandma had a good heart. As writers, we need to choose to revise. Every time we revise, we make our writing stronger. Let's use figurative language to revise this story. Let's revise two sentences to include similes. When we write a simile, we compare two things using the words like or as. Let's revise this sentence using a simile. Grandma's hug felt good. Let's rewrite the sentence using as. Grandma's hug felt as warm as the sand. Let's revise another sentence to make my writing sound stronger. Here's one. Running so fast, Drew skidded into the water. I love my verb choice. Skidded is such a strong verb because it shows action. Yet, I want to revise the sentence to include a simile. Rather than using as, I'll use like. Running so fast, Drew skidded into the water like a pebble skipping across the waves. I am going to choose to revise even more. Let's revise by adding an idiom. When we write an idiom, we use a common phrase that has a deeper meaning. I think this part of my story is unclear. When Drew teases by saying, aw, grandma, I'm not sure readers would see that exchange as teasing. I need to revise. I'm going to add an idiom so Drew really teases Grandma. To do this, I need to add more dialogue. Remember, dialogue includes the words a character speaks. I'm going to have Drew say, don't be a stick in the mud. I have to remember those quotation marks that frame what is coming out of Drew's mouth like dimples. This command, don't be a stick in the mud, has a deeper meaning. When we use this idiom, we mean that someone doesn't want to do something fun. But we know Grandma is having fun with her toes in the sand while she watches her grandson enjoy the water. As a writer, I often revise my endings. I want to choose to make my ending for this story better. Let's add a metaphor to strengthen the last sentence. Grandma had a good heart. When we write a metaphor, we say something is another thing. Rather than write Grandma had a good heart, I want to write an ending that means more. Since metaphors also hold deeper meaning, similar to idioms, that type of figurative language will work really well here. Grandma was his treasure. Of course, this doesn't mean Grandma's an actual gem, like a ruby or a diamond. She's not made of gold or silver, but we can infer or read deeper to understand that Grandma is very special to Drew. 
He sees her as a treasure, a person he truly values and loves. Let's reread our revised writing. Before Drew raced for the water, he said, Grandma, come in with me, please. No, you go, Grandma said, shaking her head. I'll sit here with my toes in the sand. Aw, Grandma, don't be a stick in the mud, Drew teased. Drew, Grandma pretended to be offended and then tousled his hair. Have fun, I'll keep my eye on you from here. Drew gave his grandma a hug. Grandma's hug felt as warm as the sand. Running so fast, Drew skidded into the water like a pebble skipping across the waves. Floating on his back, he looked up into the sky. He felt so thankful grandma brought him to the beach. Grandma was his treasure. Writers, I hope you'll choose to revise your writing using figurative language. Remember, similes help us compare two things using those special words, as and like. Metaphors let us say something is something else. Metaphors hold deeper meaning, like idioms. Idioms are common phrases that have layers of meaning. The best part about writing is we will never know how well we can write because we always get better with practice. Enjoy playing with words as you write the stories that matter to you. Hello, scholars. We are lucky to have so many beautiful Great Lakes which surround our state. However, I've heard misinformation or untrue information that because our lakes are so clear, they must be healthy. The statement is not always true. I'm Ms. Kara. Today, we are going to learn to use claims and evidence to ask questions about statements we hear like, clear water in the Great Lakes means they must be healthy. But before we can use claims and evidence to counteract misinformation, we first need to define and understand them. A claim is a conclusion made from data. Evidence is proof that supports the claim statement. For example, one claim we can make is that humans, animals, and even many plants need air to survive. The evidence we have to prove this claim is true includes the fact that our bodies use oxygen to do lots of important things, like giving us energy and keeping our organs working properly. Additionally, even though plants make oxygen, they also need it to stay healthy. They breathe through tiny holes in their leaves. Now, let's find Media Literacy Maddie to see if she can write a claim about why grass turns green in the springtime in Michigan. I've noticed when the weather warms up in the spring, everything starts to grow faster and turn green. Knowing this, I can write the following claim. Grass turns green in the springtime in Michigan because it is warmer than the winter months. Now it's your turn. What are some other claims we can make about why the grass turns green in the spring in Michigan? We might say because the springtime is rainy in Michigan, which helps with plant growth. Now, let's see what evidence Media Literacy Maddie finds to prove her claim that grass turns green in the springtime because it is warmer than the winter months. I'll use observational data collected over the past three years as evidence to support my claim. I've been recording observations for three years for the months of March, April, May, and June. And I put the data in this chart. When we look at springtime temperatures, we can clearly see that as early as March, the average temperatures are well above 32 degrees Fahrenheit. This chart shows average temperatures in the springtime and also is a brief description of the color of the grass. Average temperatures are temperatures that are about in the middle not the warmest and not the coldest for that time. I can see that the grass starts to turn green between April and June. This evidence proves that one reason why the grass turns green in the spring is the increase in warm temperatures. My claim has evidence to support it. You can find evidence from reliable sources of information, observation over time, or even statistical analysis. Statistical analysis happens when you look at numbers and data to find patterns and make conclusions about things. Pull out the claim you wrote earlier. What is some evidence to support that claim? Did you use information from a reliable source? Or maybe you chose observation like Media Literacy Maddie did. 
Next, we're going to look for some evidence to help prove or disprove the claim that clear water must be healthy. I've been reading an article called Invasive Tracking, researchers trying to trace zebra mussel infestations on the Great Lakes Now website. Zebra mussels are a freshwater shellfish that have stripes like zebras. They are an invasive species that have invaded the Great Lakes. This paragraph says, zebra mussels and quagga mussels act as a water filter by removing important food sources like plankton. This creates clear water conditions, allowing more sunlight and in turn, more plant growth and toxic algal blooms. This means zebra and quagga mussels filter the water and make it look clear, but also cause it to be unhealthy. This is one piece of evidence which disproves the claim that clear water in the Great Lakes means they are healthy. However, one example of evidence is usually not enough. I need more evidence to make a claim. Here's another example from PBS NewsHour. The article refers to the quagga mussel filtering out particles in the water like food for fish and causing poisonous algae blooms, which both make the water clear. So even though clear water in the Great Lakes might be nice to look at, it also means the water isn't always healthy. In addition to digital articles and videos I've looked at on my own, we've looked at two reliable sources of information today which provide us with evidence that clear water in the Great Lakes isn't always healthy. Therefore, our claim should be that clear blue water in the Great Lakes doesn't always mean the lake is healthy. Here is one last activity to try. Can you identify misinformation, evidence, and claim statements? If you answered evidence, misinformation, and claim, you are correct. Today, we learn to counter misinformation by finding evidence from reliable sources and making accurate claims. Now you'll be prepared the next time you hear or read misinformation, which probably needs a closer look. Oh, way. Why would you have to pay to be rescued? This can't be true. Can it? Hello everyone, I'm Miss Rogers. Have you ever heard something and thought, wait, is that really true? Maybe you saw it online or even heard it from a friend. Well, today I'll show you a cool way to be a detective and find out for yourself. We'll learn how to fact check by using a simple tool called a T-chart to compare different sources and uncover the truth. I'll model this for you so you can try it on your own sometime. A T-chart is a graphic organizer that helps us compare information from different sources. It's called a T-chart because it looks like the letter T. We can use it to organize the information we find in different articles, videos, or books and compare them. On the left side of the T-chart, we'll write what we learned from the first source. And on the right side, we'll write down what we learned from the second source. This will help us see if both sources say the same thing or if there are differences. I found two articles that I think will help us get to the bottom of this sleeping bear rescue situation. Let's read them to check the accuracy of the post I saw earlier. Is it true you may have to pay to be rescued from sleeping bear dunes? After we read the first article, we'll complete our T-chart with the details we learn. Guide to Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore. How to hike, stay safe, what to bring. It depends on who helps you and how, but if Glen Lakes Fire Department gets called to the scene and machinery gets involved, you may have to shell out serious cash to reimburse officials for their efforts. A sprained ankle at the top of an overlook, for example, probably wouldn't cost you, Glen Lakes Fire Department Chief Brian Ferguson said. However, if you need to be taken out on an ATV or carried by hand, 
by firefighters, that may fall into their basic rescue category, which cost about $652. The next level up is a specialized rescue, which can cost $1,630. If mutual aid is called out, a boat is needed, or the U.S. Coast Guard has to break out its helicopter, visitors could shell out $2,280 for the advanced technical rescue, Ferguson said. Hmm. Mutual aid. That was new to me, but seeing that they talk about additional transportation or agencies like the U.S. Coast Guard, it must mean that if other partners are used, the amount of money for the rescue increases. I guess that makes sense because all their time and resources cost money. Now, let's start completing our T-chart. What are some details we learned about rescues at Sleeping Bear Dunes? According to the article, if the Glen Lakes Fire Department helps you out at the dunes, you might have to pay depending on how you are rescued. For example, a basic rescue could cost about $652, and a more advanced one with a helicopter might cost $2,280. This tells us that yes, there is a cost involved for rescue if special equipment is needed. Okay, so we have one source that confirms what we saw in the social media posts. But I have more questions now. Like, why would someone need a helicopter rescue from the dunes anyway? And how often do these rescues happen? Let's see what information we can learn from the second article. Before we start, let's preview a few vocabulary words we'll see. Overlooks are places where you can look at something from a higher spot. Clarity means understanding. An outlying community is an area that is far from the main city or town. Rescue efforts in the park are most common at overlooks number nine and 10 on Sleeping Bear famous Pier Stocking Drive where the drop to the lake can be 450 feet down the dune. After warning signs got some social media attention this summer, Glen Lakes firefighters took to their Facebook page to add some clarity. First, the fire department emphasized the number of personnel involved in the rescue. When a visitor can't make it back up the steep dune on their own, it takes all on-duty personnel from both fire stations as well as several National Park Service rangers to pitch in on the rescue. Since it's all hands on deck, that means first responders from outlying communities then would have to fill in if there is another local emergency while the Glen Lake firefighters are tending to a park rescue. This is one reason for rescue charges, to reduce responses to this location so we can adequately provide services to those who pay for them, firefighters said in their Facebook post. Additionally, the cost of the equipment needed for a rescue adds to the nearly $3,000 fee. For example, rescue rope is routinely left in disrepair following a complex sand dune operation, according to the post. Okay, this article gives us a bit more information about rescues and why they are necessary. Rescues at Sleeping Bear Dunes can cost up to $3,000, especially for rescues at overlooks number nine and 10. The reason for the high cost is because it takes a lot of firefighters and equipment to help people get back up the steep dunes. And the cost helps make sure they can still respond to other emergencies in the area. Now that we've filled in the T-chart, let's compare what we've learned from both articles. Both sources agree that you may have to pay if you need to be rescued at Sleeping Bear Dunes. Article one lists the specific costs for different types of rescues like using an ATV or a helicopter. Article two doesn't give costs for specific types of rescues, but it gives more info about why rescues at Sleeping Bear are needed and why they can be expensive. Using a T-chart like this, helps us understand important details. In this case, we now know that people might have to pay to be rescued at Sleeping Bear Dunes because rescue requires a lot of resources. Both articles tell us that there's a cost. 
And by cross-referencing the two texts, we get a clearer picture of why the cost is so high. So I guess the video I saw online was true after all. Learning how to cross-reference information is important because not all sources will say the same thing. By comparing information we find from multiple sources, we can make sure that what we've learned is accurate and complete. Next time you're watching or reading something, try using a T-chart to help you organize and check the information you hear. It's a great way to be sure that what you've learned is true. See you next time. show you care manage actions keep your cool reach your goals follow the rules see a friend don't just stand there few share a smile that's what we do make good choices think it through make good choices think it through have you ever organized a game or activity for your friends or family if so you were being a leader Greetings, friends. I'm Miss Yarnell, your 21st century skills coach. What are 21st century skills? 21st century skills are the skills and knowledge you need to do well, be happy, and keep learning in school and in life. And today, we're going to explore what it means to be a leader and how each of us can show leadership in our own unique ways. Are you ready? All the board, future leaders and captains. Picture this. You're the captain of a ship. As the captain, you guide your crew, make important decisions, and face challenges head on to reach your destination. Leadership is like being that captain, not just on a ship, but in all you do. You can show leadership at school, in sports, or even at home by being responsible, helping others, and setting a good example. Remember, being a leader doesn't mean you have to do everything alone. It means working with others and bringing out the best in everyone to reach your goals together. How can you become a great leader? Here are some lessons I learned from being a student athlete at Duke University. Listening to my teammates helped us understand each other better. Being responsible by showing up to practice on time and making good decisions on and off the court made a big difference. Encouraging teamwork made sure everyone got a chance to shine, and we played better as a team. By being kind, honest, and fair, I set a good example that others followed. When problems came up, my teammates knew they could count on me to solve them quickly and keep our team united. Believing in myself and being confident inspired me to keep working hard at improving my basketball skills and study hard. Clear communication with my teammates kept us organized during the games. Even when we lost, staying positive motivated us to try our best. All right, friends, it's journal quest time. Your mission? Think about the leadership traits we talked about. Listening, being responsible, teamwork, fairness, honesty, kindness, problem solving, being positive, and clear communication. Imagine you were going to lead a project for your family or friends like cleaning a park or starting a book club. You would need to plan it well, listen to everyone's ideas, and make it happen together. Write about which trade you'd work on, why, and how you'd get better at it. Always remember, being a leader doesn't mean being a boss or someone who just tells others what to do, or that you are in charge all the time. It's about caring, healthy, and inspiring those around you. Mistakes are okay. They're just stepping stones to becoming a better leader. So go ahead and lead with kindness, courage, and imagination. The world is waiting for your bright ideas and bold spirit. Thank you for spending this time with us. Until our next adventure, we will close with a song by Miss Melody Jones titled, Know Yourself. Social awareness, see through others' eyes. Show some empathy and always be wise. Understand how this lend a helping hand. Together we're stronger, together we stand. Relationship skills, connect the dots. Build strong friendships, get it all you got. Responsible decisions pave the way for you to do right every single day. Thank you for watching. For videos, activity guides, and more, please visit our website, michiganlearning.org. And don't forget to read, write, roar.
This program is made possible in part by the state of Michigan and by and by viewers like you. Thank you.